it is commonly assumed by most people that the fossil record provides the support for evolution. And of course, that should be the case. That really should be the case if evolution is true. What greater evidence for evolution could we have than the fossil record? After all, the fossil record is the record of life that we have inscribed in the rocks. And if evolution is true, then of course, that fossil record should provide the very best evidence for evolution. Well, what evidence should we expect from the fossil record if evolution is true? Well, evolution is believed that life began about, oh, three billion years ago, plus or minus a few hundred million years, and that life began as some little microscopic organism, maybe something like a bacterium or amoeba or something like that. And during the vast stretch of time since that, since that time, hundreds of millions of years, this little microscopic organism has diversified and evolved into everything living today and that has ever lived. Now, if that's true, then I think you could see that this process would have produced literally billions, times billions, times billions of transitional form or intermediate types as that little microscopic organism uh, evolved into a multicellular organism. And then this multicellular organism diversified into the vast array of complex invertebrates that now exist and have existed. And then that invertebrate, whether it be a clam or a snail or a jellyfish or a worm or something like that, gradually evolved into a fish or the vertebrates. And then this fish evolved into amphibians. And of course, that would require that the fins would gradually change into feet and legs. And of course, many other changes would have to take place for a fish to change into an amphibian. Then we are told the amphibian evolved into reptiles. And then reptiles evolved into birds. And that means, of course, the scale of the reptile had to gradually change into feathers. And the four limbs of the reptile had to change gradually into wings. That would have produced an enormous number of intermediate stages. And of course, it is suggested the reptile evolved into mammals. And mammals evolved into the higher mammals or primates, and primates evolved into people. Supposedly, this process took place over these hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. And of course, according to evolution theory, it is the successful organism that evolved. What is the successful organism? The one that reproduces in larger numbers. So there be very large populations of these intermediates. You, you cannot claim that the intermediates would be inefficient. They would not be very highly suited, you see, to survive, so they'd be in few numbers. No, that's not true at all. According to evolution, it is a successful organism that evolves, and the successful organism is the one who reproduces in larger numbers. So at all times during this evolutionary process, there'd be very large population of these evolving creatures or the intermediate forms or the transitional types, you see. Therefore, evolution would have produced an enormous number of intermediates or transitional forms. Billions, times billions, times billions of those things would have lived and died. If evolution is true, our museum should contain millions and millions and millions of fossils of these intermediates. Today in our museums, we have about a quarter of a million different fossil species uh, represented by tens of millions of cataloged fossils. A quarter of a million. Now, if evolution is true, quite obviously, then tens of thousands of those fossils should be of intermediate types. Why? There should be no doubt about the fact of evolution. It should be the most well-established fact known in science. All we'd have to do is just look at the fossils right there in front of us. On the museum shelves, in the museum displays, we would have abundant evidence of the fact of evolution. 
On the other hand, if creation is true, we'd expect something very different, wouldn't we? If creation is true, you see, each one of the basic types of plant and animal, what one might call basic morphological designs, or what we creationists would call the created kind. An onion would be an onion, and a lily would be a lily, a tiger would be a tiger, monkeys would be monkeys, and people would be people. We'd expect to find the fossils, you see, of each basic type appearing fully formed with no evidence that these basic types have arisen from a common ancestor. Now, there'd be variation within the limits of each kind, of course. We know today we have many races of people. We have many varieties of dogs. As Darwin noted when he visited the Galapagos Islands, there are many varieties of finches. But you see, what the creationist points out is that those finches in the Galapagos Islands are not only still birds, they're still finches. And we may have many varieties of intermediate forms, the transitional forms that would have been produced as some invertebrate became a vertebrate or a fish. On the other hand, the creationist prediction would be very, very different than that. Sudden appearance of each kind with no ancestors and no intermediate form. Now let us look at the fossil record and see what the fossil record produces. Does it produce these intermediate forms demanded by the theory of evolution? Or do we find that the gaps in the fossil record are systematic? That is, we do not find at any level any intermediate forms. We should expect the phyla, the classes, the orders, families, down to including the genera at least, each would appear fully formed with no transitional form. Now we want to look at first at creatures that are found in so-called Cambrian rocks. Evolutionists believe that Cambrian rocks began to form about 600 million years ago. And they believe now if you took all of these Cambrian rocks scattered all over the world, totaled them all up, assuming the sediment that formed those rocks settled out of the water just a fraction of an inch per year, it would take something like 80 million years for these Cambrian rocks to form. Now, first of all, how do we know that a Cambrian rock is a Cambrian rock? By the type of fossil that's found in those rocks. No matter whether the rocks are on the very surface, whether they're buried deep in the earth or some intermediate point. We call it a Cambrian rock if it has certain types of fossils. The index fossils for Cambrian rocks generally is a, some type of a trilobite or a brachiopod. Now, in these Cambrian rocks are billions times billions of fossils of very complex invertebrates. Now, first of all, I would not have the slightest idea how you would get fossils under conditions suggested by evolution. If you have sediment settling out of the water just a fraction of an inch per year, you see, it would take a long time for a rock to accumulate and to entomb the fossil. Now, when an animal dies and just lies around on the ground or floats around in the water, you don't get a fossil that way because scavengers will consume it or oxidation or other deteriorative processes would destroy the creature. Bones, teeth, and everything. Nothing remains. For a fossil to form, it must be buried. The creature must be buried and be buried very quickly in order to preserve it, you see. Now, in these rocks, we have this enormous number of fossils. We believe that these were produced not by slow, gradual deposition over hundreds of millions of years of time, but were produced catastrophically. They'd have to be produced catastrophically in order for these fossils to form. We believe that much of the fossil record was produced by the flood described in the book of Genesis. But regardless of how they got there or when they got there, there they are. And their existence demands an explanation. In the Cambrian rocks, 
We find these very, very complicated creatures. We find fossils of jellyfish and sponges, brachiopods, trilobites, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, clams, snails, worms, and a great variety of other very complex invertebrates. Now, as I mentioned earlier, evolutionists believe that these things evolved beginning with a little microscopic organism. Now, if that's true, then in the rocks which generally underlie the Cambrian rocks, they're called Precambrian rocks. And by the way, many of these Precambrian rocks are perfectly preserved, uh, suitable for the preservation of fossils. They are undisturbed. And if the fossils are there, they certainly should be found in those Precambrian rocks. Now, based upon evolutionary theory, of course, the Precambrian rocks must contain the evolutionary ancestors of these very complicated invertebrates. Billions times billions of fossils of those transitional forms or ancestors should be there. Now, in those Precambrian rocks are found fossils of little microscopic, single-celled, soft-bodied bacteria and algae. Now, I believe you will agree that if we can find fossils of little soft-bodied microscopic bacteria in those Precambrian rocks, we certainly should be able to find all of the transitional forms between those microscopic organisms and these complicated invertebrates. That is, if evolution really has taken place. Those rocks, you see, if evolution is true, must produce the history of evolution between the microscopic organism and these complicated invertebrates. What do we actually find in those Precambrian rocks? Well, they've been searched all over the world intensely ever since Darwin. Bottoms of the oceans have been searched, but nowhere on the face of this earth have we been able to find a fossil of an ancestor for a single one of those complicated invertebrates, not one. Trilobites, when we first see them, they are trilobites. They are complete, and they are very complicated creatures with eyes that have astounded the scientists. The eyes have had, they have shown perfect vision. And we have clams and snails and all of these other very complicated invertebrates, a vast array of complicated invertebrates are found in those Cambrian rocks, and we have not found ancestors for a single one, not even one. They all appear fully formed right at the start. Now, evolutionists have termed this the major mystery of the history of life. The creation scientists, on the other hand, said, what greater evidence for creation could the rocks give than this explosive appearance of this vast array of complicated invertebrates without a trace of an ancestor. Now, evolution cannot be true. You just could not have hundreds of millions of years of evolution without leaving a trace. That's just not physically possible. Now, furthermore, evolutionists suggest that one of these invertebrates evolved into a fish. Now, fishes are supposed to be the first vertebrates. Now, to the evolutionists, where would an a vertebrate come from? Where would fishes come from? Where else could they come from? They'd have to come from some invertebrate, you see. So they say, as an article of faith, that fishes evolved from invertebrates or some invertebrate. They believe it took 100 million years. Why, during that 100 million years, billions times billions of the transitional form between some invertebrate and a fish you see, would have been produced. Fishes are vertebrates like you and me. They have an internal skeleton. They have a backbone. The invertebrates found in those Cambrian rocks are either soft-bodied like uh, the jellyfish or worms, or they may have a shell or an exoskeleton such as a trilobite. And so we have the invertebrate evolving into the vertebrate. 100 million years, billions times billions times billions of the intermediate should have been produced. Our museum should have millions and millions and millions of fossils of the transitional form showing what invertebrate evolved into a fish on the course of that evolution. As a matter of fact, they don't even have one. Not even one 
fossil of a transitional form between the invertebrate and the fish. Every major kind of fish that we know anything about appears fully formed right at the start without a trace of an ancestor. I have, in my many debates, I have challenged my evolutionary opponents with these major facts. I said, please explain to this audience how you could have 100 million years of evolution during which time some invertebrate evolves into a fish and yet not leave a trace. I have always been met with thunderous silence. They say not a word. They offer no explanation. They don't even try to offer to answer the challenge because, you see, they have no answer. There is no answer. It is not physically possible to have 100 million years of evolution and producing billions times billions of intermediate forms and not leaving a trace. It's just not possible. You see, that really settles the matter of the fossil record. We really don't have to talk about Archaeopteryx or any of these other things because we've already settled the matter. Evolution has not taken place on this earth. But you see, there is much other evidence from the fossil record. Evolutionists believe in the course of time that some, some fish evolved into an amphibian, that we made the transition from water to land. They're not sure why that took place, but they believe that it did take place. And of course, it took millions of years of time for that to happen. As the fish gradually evolved and became an amphibian, such as a salamander or a frog or a toad or something like that, a creature that spend much time on the land, much time in the water, and must lay its eggs in the water because those eggs do not have shells, such as in the case of the reptile. Now, of course, if that's really true, then the fins of the fish had to gradually change into feet and legs of the amphibian. Now, there's a characteristic, you see, that would have changed something quite obvious that we could look for. We could, we could imagine what the intermediate forms may have resembled so we know what to look for. Well, what kind of evidence do we have for such a change? Well, on this slide, we see a reproduction of the fish in the upper portion of the slide that is supposed to be the ancestor of the amphibian. In the lower portion of the slide, we see a reproduction of what is supposed to be the world's oldest known amphibian. Now, why do evolutionists believe that that fish evolved into the amphibian? Well. First of all, you note that there's some bones in the fins that evolutionists believe could have evolved into the feet and legs of the amphibian. You note, of course, that there's several other fins uh, that had bones, but apparently he found some way to get rid of these, allowing the others to evolve into feet and legs. Now, the evolutionists also suggest it's a similarity in the vertebrae, so some connection, and there's a similarity in the pattern of bones in the skull. Now, these are characteristics which are supposed to indicate that fish was the ancestor of the amphibian. But I want you to know, first of all, the fish was a fish, 100% fish. It had a lovely set of fins designed for balancing, steering, and locomotion in the water. Look at the amphibian. What do you note? He had the basic amphibian limb, feet and legs. There's not a trace of an intermediate form. Furthermore, note the pelvic bone of the fish. Very small, loosely embedded in muscle. There is no connection between the pelvic bone of the fish and the vertebral column. Well, none is needed. The fins do not support the weight of the body. But look at the pelvic bone of the amphibian. It's very large and firmly anchored to the vertebral column. That is the type of anatomy you need for four-legged locomotion. The tremendous difference, and not one single intermediate has ever been found showing something partway between the fin and the feet and legs, or showing these other changes. Now, here we see an exhibit from the Chicago Museum of Natural History a number of years ago on the evolution of the fish into the amphibian. And you'll note, in between, there's a remarkable transitional form part fish and part amphibian. 
What remarkable evidence for evolution. Isn't that convincing? How could you see an exhibit like this and not believe in evolution? Well, if you look at the fine print under that intermediate form, you'll find that it's labeled inferred intermediate. Well, inferred indeed. It's strictly imaginary. No one has ever been able to find such a transitional form. The great collection of fossils from Chicago could not produce it. No museum in the world could produce it. No scientist could produce it. So they had the artist produce it. But you see, that's not science. That's artistic license. And that, of course, is an admission of failure. They've never found any intermediate form. Now, on this slide, we see a picture of one of the preserved specimens of a remarkable fish called a coelacanth. Now, the coelacanth fish is supposed to be a very, very close cousin, very close kin to the fish that evolved into the amphibian. Now, evolutionists believe for well, for a very long time, that the coelacanth fish had become extinct, they say, 70 million years ago. Now, they postulate that this fish evolved 400 million years ago, and then he died out 70 million years ago. Because, they say, in rocks, 70 million years or younger, they have never found fossils of that fish. So, obviously, he died out 70 million years ago, until 1938 when he's found to be alive and well off the coast of Africa. And since that time, several dozen specimens of this creature has been found. Guess what? He just forgot to evolve. He's just the same old fish he was supposedly 70 million years ago. As a matter of fact, 400 million years ago on the evolutionary time scale. And his anatomy made him totally unsuitable to be the ancestor of the amphibian. Now, we have something very strange here, don't we? This creature, the very close cousin of the fish that supposedly evolved in an amphibian, has remained the same old fish for all of these multiplied millions of years. But his close cousin evolved not only the amphibian, but all the way up into people. Something seemed to be very strange here about this theory of evolution. Now, in the past, there existed creatures called marine reptiles. Now, these were reptiles, but they lived in the sea. We don't have them today. At least uh, we don't have one of them in the San Diego Zoo that I know of or the aquarium. And, and until we do, I just don't believe they really do exist. But they must have existed because we find their fossils scattered around the world. Here we see a fossil of a plesiosaur, one of these marine reptiles. Notice that it had paddles. Didn't have feet and legs, but it had paddles. Now, if evolution really is true, then we ought to have a series of intermediates showing the feet and legs of the land reptile gradually evolving into paddles as the creature made the transition from land to water. You see, evolutionists believe the fish worked real hard to get out on land, and then these creatures worked real hard to get back into the water. And so we ought to have many, many intermediate forms. Not one. Not one has ever been found. Now, evolutionists also believe that some land reptile evolved into land mammals. And uh, then they believe that some hairy four-legged mammal, as they say, this is what they say, some hairy four-legged mammal, perhaps in search of food or sanctuary, ventured into the water. And over eons of time, it gradually evolved into whales and dolphins as the tail changed into flukes, and the hind legs gradually disappeared, and the front legs changed into flippers. And one scientist published an article in Scientific American a number of years ago in which he suggested that the ancestor of the whales may have resembled a pig, a cow, or a buffalo. Well, one of our creation scientists uh, tried to visualize what these intermediates may have looked like. So I sat down with an artist and uh, tried to reconstruct, perhaps, what the intermediates may have looked like. And he uh, took the suggestion of one of these evolutionists that the ancestor may have resembled a cow. And uh, we see, indeed, the cow venturing into the water. And her tail changes into flukes. And her hind legs gradually disappeared. And the front legs changed into flippers. 
And I suppose if we had a failure in that structure underneath the cow, we would just have to call it an utter failure. But uh, fortunately, everything worked out very nicely, and we ended up with a whale. Now, you see, I, now this is a caricature, of course, of what evolution may have believed. But I've challenged evolutionists, if you don't like these suggestions, what are yours? Can you explain how some four-legged mammal may have ventured into the water and stay there for eons of time as these changes gradually uh, occurred, which were necessary, you see, to live in the sea like a whale lives? Well, they've never been able to do that. Just recently, there's an article about a creature called Basilosaurus. Basilosaurus means king lizard, originally classified as a reptile. This article suggested that they have found the fossils of a creature that has front legs and hind legs, and they claim that it's related to mammals, even to whales. To make that claim of related to a whale or mammal, they referred back to an article published in 1839. That was the only claim, the only support for the, the idea that this thing was related to a whale. Actually, I, I am convinced it's nothing but a reptile. Evolutionists are so desperately searching for some hint, some indication, you see, of intermediate form, they are grasping for straws. Well, we see there are no intermediate forms in that case. Here's another rather unusual creature, the duck-billed platypus. Now, there's a real puzzler for evolutionists. You know they don't know what to do with that creature. He is a mammal. These creatures are mammals. They're warm-blooded. The mother produces milk for the babies. They have hair, they have the characteristics of mammals, and yet they have duck bills, web feet, and lay eggs. And they have the shoulder girdle of a reptile, and they have spurs on the hind legs similar to poisonous spurs, similar to other reptiles. So they have characteristics of mammals, reptiles, and birds. What are you going to do with a creature like that? You see, he's not a fit ancestor for anything, nor could he be an offspring for anything. They just don't know what to do with the duck-billed platypus. As a matter of fact, the first specimen sent to England from Australia, the English scientists thought that those Australians were pulling their leg, that they had taken parts of three different creatures, stitched them together, and were trying to fool those uh, English scientists. No, he's a real creature. And I imagine God is sitting up there laughing at some of these evolutions as they try to puzzle what in the world are we going to do with the duck-billed platypus. Certainly, you see, God created that creature just the way that we find him. And uh, is therefore, is the evidence that we'd expect, or could expect from creation, but certainly not on the basis of evolution theory. Now, flight should provide a remarkable test case of creation versus evolution. Because, you see, flight occurs in four different classes of animal. It occurs in the flying insects. It occurs in birds. It occurs in the flying mammals or bats. And it occurred, it did occur, in the flying reptiles now extinct. So we have four different times, according to evolutionists, during which this evolution occurred from some land animal gradually changing into a flying animal. Of course, each process supposedly took place over millions of years of time, producing an enormous number of transitional forms. So we have multiplied opportunities, you see, to find these transitional forms. And the flight, then, should provide solid evidence for evolution, if evolution is true. On the other hand, if creation is true, we'd expect each one of these flying creatures to appear as flying creatures, with no evidence, you see, that they had gradually evolved from some land animal. Well, we want to take a look, first of all, at the flying insect. Here we see a dragonfly, one of the flying insects. Evolutionists believe that the uh, dragonflies evolved, oh, perhaps 400 million years ago. And here we see one of the fossils of a dragonfly. This fossil is supposed to be 380 million years old, according to evolution. A fossil dragonfly. Well, again, the dragonfly 
And then the fossil. What do we have? We have a dragonfly. You see, essentially the same as the modern dragonfly. We found many fossils of flying insects in the fossil record, sometimes very nearly perfectly preserved. Then we find fossils of the non-flying insects. Here's a fossil ant captured in amber, supposedly several tens of millions of years old. And what is he? He's an ant, you see. And they found fossils of many other non-flying insects. They found fossils of mites, spiders, daddy long legs, centipedes, and things like that. And these scientists said they were, and they're supposed to be, about 350 million years old. And they said that those creatures were so perfectly preserved, it looks like they just died yesterday. Well, frankly, I believe yesterday is closer to the truth than 350 million years. But nevertheless, they postulate that these fossil insects, 350 million years old, and they found fossils of cockroaches believed to be more than 350 million years old, and they said they looked disgustingly similar to modern cockroaches. And they found fossils of pseudoscorpions. Now, pseudoscorpions are scorpions, or they look like scorpions, only they don't have a stinger. So they're called pseudoscorpions. We have many species of pseudoscorpions today, and previously in the fossil record, they'd found fossils of pseudoscorpions they believe to be about 35 million years old. That's their claim. Recently, they found fossils of pseudoscorpions they believe to be 390 million years old. And they were remarkably similar to modern pseudoscorpions. And some of these creatures, some of these fossils, they, the most delicate structures were preserved. Spinnerets on the spiders and things like that preserved there in the fossils. It's hard to imagine how anything could pre be preserved for more than 300 million years, that delicate, you see. But that's what they claim. Now, in other words, we have many fossils of non-flying insects. We have many fossils of flying insects. But I'll tell you one thing we do not have is a fossil of an intermediate form. You know, evolutionists argue among themselves, what is it on the non-flying insect that evolved into wings? Why do they quarrel? Why do they have the controversy? Because we have never found one single transitional form. In one of the papers on this subject, the scientist said, now this argument will have to be settled by the future discovery of some intermediate form. Not one, not one intermediate has ever been found. You have non-flying insect, you have flying insects, but not one single intermediate. Isn't that strange? Well, not strange at all, you see, if God created those creatures, but very strange, unexpected from the evolutionist's point of view. Now, evolutionists also believe, of course, that the flying reptiles evolved. On this slide, we see Rhomphorhynchus. Rhomphorhynchus, as you see, had a long tail with a rudder. And note the fourth finger that supported the wing membrane. All flying reptiles had enormously long fourth fingers to which the wing membrane was attached, stretched between that fourth finger and the body of the reptile. Now, this particular flying reptile, you note, had teeth. He was a tooth reptile. This is Rhomphorhynchus. Now, here we see another one of the flying reptiles. This is the Pteranodon. The Pteranodon had a long toothless beak. And in this case, the fourth finger supported a wing spread up to 54 feet. Why, that's longer than the F-4 Phantom Jet. I don't know about you. I'm glad that critter is extinct. I wouldn't want one of those things flying around today. But look at those creatures. Now, evolutionists believe that flying reptiles evolved from non-flying reptiles. Now, let's try to imagine how this may have taken place. We have this ordinary reptile, and then he, under, he, he has a mutation. One of the genetic accident makes his fourth fingers just a wee bit longer. Now, for some strange unknown reason, this converts survival value. So in the struggle for existence, the reptile with slightly longer fourth fingers replaces the ordinary reptile. 
And now we have this reptile with slightly longer fingers. And then after thousands of years and a lot of bad mutations which are eliminated, we have another happy accident. Another good mutation makes these fingers get just a wee bit longer again. Struggle for existence, eliminating the original. And then thousands of years later, another happy accident. Fingers get longer and longer and longer and longer. Thousands of mutations gradually through millions of years of time make the fingers get longer and longer and longer. Now, would you believe it? At the same time, other genetic accidents, the genetic mistakes that we call mutation, have created the wing membrane, the flight muscles, the hollow bones, and the case of the pteranodon has converted an ordinary jaws and teeth into a long, toothless beak. Now, imagine. Let's, let us suppose we're about 25% along the way, and this creature has 25% wings. Well, obviously he can't fly. But he can't run any longer either. He's run around dragging those worthless, useless appendages around there. He can't catch prey. He can't escape predatory. What's going to happen? He's going to be eliminated, isn't he? You see, once the flying reptile is complete, he has wing membranes, flight muscles, and all the other character, all these characteristics required to fly. He flies. But you see, no intermediate stage would ever survive. And as a matter of fact, not even a trace of an ancestor has ever been found. Not even a trace. These flying reptiles appear abruptly, just as you have seen them on the screen, as we see them in the slide, complete from the start. That is powerful, positive evidence for creation, and absolutely contradictory to evolution theory. Now, <clears throat> the same case in the case of the bat. A bat is a flying mammal. Notice that the wing membrane is supported by those long fingers. And again, you see, then that means it's some ordinary land mammal, maybe a, a rat-like creature or a squirrel-like creature, gradually evolved into a bat as the fingers got longer and longer and longer and the wing membrane had to be created and flight muscles and all of these. And of course, in many bats, they have a sonar system, a method of echolocation, whereby they send out a signal which ricochets off the object, come back and received by the bat, and he interprets that signal. And he can identify the object and its speed and its location. And he can receive his own signal and identify that signal among thousands of signals that are going out by other bats. A remarkable system. That bat supposedly evolved during millions of years of time from some ordinary mammal. Well, here we see on the slide a picture of the world's oldest known bat. This was taken from the cover page of Science, December 9, 1966. Dr. Glenn Jepson, the author of the article, claimed that these fossilized bones that we see in the center of the slide were found in rocks 50 million years old. And he said nothing related to a bat has ever been found that's older than this. And we see a reconstruction of what this bat must have looked like. All right. According to this evolutionist, here we have him, the world's oldest known bat. And what is he? 100% bat. He's essentially identical to a modern bat. He appears abruptly in the fossil record, and there is not a trace of an ancestor, not a trace of a transitional form has ever been found. And essentially no change since he appeared in the fossil record supposedly 50 million years ago. Is that the evidence that we'd expect for evolution? Of course not. But isn't it remarkably in accord with creation? Powerful, positive evidence for creation. Ah, but the evolutionist says, just a moment. We have Archaeopteryx. Now, there is a transitional form. This bird, they say, have characteristics intermediate or has some characteristics that are reptilian and some characteristics that are bird-like, showing that he came from a reptile. Well, here we see the reconstruction of Archaeopteryx. Now, first of all, we note that he was a bird. He had the basic form and pattern of the avian wing. He had feathers that were identical to the feathers of modern birds. And fe feathers are very, very complicated structures. Now, the scale of the reptile is a flat, horny sheath. But a, a feather, on the other hand, has a central shaft. It has the barbs that radiate from the shaft, 
have barbules hooked onto the barb and little hooks on the barbule. And that allows the feather to be stiff, firm, and yet very light. And they are designed for aerodynamic function. And they develop totally different than the scale. The scale is merely a fold uh, in the epidermis, while the feather, of course, is very complicated and develops from a follicle, just like the hairs on your head. Now, he did have teeth, had claws on the wings, and he had a long tail. And that's supposed to indicate that he came from a reptile. Well, maybe, but maybe not. What about the teeth? Well, it's true that modern birds do not have teeth, but in the fossil records, some birds had teeth and some did not. You know, that's not surprising because that's true of fishes. Some fishes have teeth, some do not. Some amphibians have teeth, some do not. Some reptiles have teeth, some do not. Most mammals have teeth, some do not. And I suppose most of us have teeth and some do not. But you see, you really, the presence or absence of teeth does not necessarily say something about our ultimate ancestry. But what about the claws on the wings? Doesn't that show that birds came from reptiles? Well, as a matter of fact, there are several birds living today that have claws on the wing. They include the Hawatsan. The juvenile Hawatsan has two claws on its wings. Very handy for climbing back up in the nest when that little Hawatsan has to escape the nest when it's threatened. It can crawl back up in the nest, you see. The Taraco of Africa has claws on the wing. The ostrich has three very nice claws on the wing. But no one would claim for a moment that these birds are intermediate because they are alive and well today. Now, furthermore, some scientists from Texas Tech University just in recent years found fossils of a bird in Texas which they claim to be about 225 million years old. Now, Archaeopteryx supposedly lived on this earth 150 million years ago. This bird supposedly lived on the earth 225 million years ago, 75 million years older than Archaeopteryx. So it should be almost reptilian very much more reptilian than Archaeopteryx. But as a matter of fact, it turned out to be even more bird-like than Archaeopteryx. The evidence you see shows that birds have always been birds. The flying reptiles have always been flying reptiles. Bats have always been bats, and flying insects have always been insects. Here where we should have the best evidence for evolution, you see, it is not there. We have what the creationists would expect. We find this to be true throughout the fossil record. Each major type appears fully formed right at the start. Tremendous, powerful, positive evidence for creation, but contradictory to evolution. Now, just to demonstrate that what we have said is not the exception, but the general rule, let me quote from Dr. E.J.H. Corner, a botanist at Cambridge University. This man is an evolutionist. He said, much evidence can be adduced in favor of the theory of evolution from biology, biogeography, and paleontology. But I still think that to the unprejudiced, the fossil record of plants is in favor of spatial creation. End of quote. See what the man says? If you're unprejudiced, you have an open mind, in his field, as a botanist, he says the fossil record supports creation, not evolution. Now... Dr. Colin Patterson, the famous evolutionist or well-known paleontologist of, at the British Museum of Natural History, Dr. Patterson, certainly not a creationist, but this man has been very frank about many things. He published a book called Evolution a number of years ago. One of our creation scientists purchased that book and read it, enjoyed it, and Dr. Patterson invited comments from the readers. So my friend, this creation scientist, wrote to Dr. Patterson, this well-known paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History. He said, Dr. Patterson, I enjoyed your book very much, but it would have been helpful if in that book you had presented some of the transitional forms. Uh, at least, perhaps, you could have had an artist illustrate what you think these things look like. In a letter dated April 10, 1979, Dr. Patterson wrote to this creation scientist, and he made the following statement. Quote, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. 
You suggest an artist should be asked to visualize such transformation, but where would he get the information from? I could not honestly provide it, and if I were to leave it to artistic license, would that not mislead the reader? End of quote. What does this famous paleontologist say? Sitting among one of the greatest collection of fossils in the world, he says, you're right. I don't have any examples of transitional forms in my book, but if I had known of any, I certainly would have included him. We see that the fossil record powerfully supports creation, but is directly contradictory to the theory of evolution. Thank you.